Welcome to the Bible Made Clear. We're going to move through 1 Thessalonians today. And Paul wrote this letter in around 50 or 51 AD uh, during his stay in Corinth. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, Acts 17, 18 and 19 are referenced there. So as we look at it, when was it written? Um, both First and the Second Thessalonians were written somewhere around 51. Now, Second Thessalonians was about a year or so afterwards, so it was relatively close, uh, and they have a, they definitely have a close tie. But that's about the time. Um, and as we look at where Thessalonica is, uh, Paul passed through Thessalonica uh, on his way through Europe. So you can see Troas, where they left from. Uh, they came to Philippi, that's uh, Acts 16, when they went over there. And then Paul hit Thessalonica and then moved on to Berea. Notice in Acts 17, uh, it says that the Bereans um, were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they were a little bit more studious. They wanted to make sure Paul was telling them the truth. Um, but the Thessalonians were definitely um, a faithful church. So <clears throat> the length of Paul's visit was pretty short on this missionary journey. Uh, they came to Thessalonica, Acts 17, uh, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, this is what Paul used as a method, went into them, into the synagogue for three Sabbath days, um, basically three weeks, reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. He's the Messiah. And some of them were persuaded. Now, the reason that it was important that Paul showed that the Messiah needed to suffer is because Jews expected the Messiah to come and reign. And Jesus did not do that in his first coming. So, um, but what I want to emphasize here <clears throat> is, first of all, uh, Paul was only at Thessalonica for three weeks. And uh, he gave them quite a bit of information. Uh, he taught a lot in a short amount of time. His custom was to visit the synagogues first. So when he would go into a town, he would look for the synagogue. And remember, you could not have a synagogue unless you had 10 adult Jewish males in that town. Which is why when they went to Philippi, he went down by the river where people were praying because there were not enough males in Philippi. It was a pagan center. That's where he met Lydia. So his custom was to basically go in and first of all approach the Jews where they had the scriptures and they understood um, the Old Testament and then he would use that knowledge to try to share with them that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah based on what he did. Um, so he presented the prophecies in the Old Testament of Christ and then he would gather the believers out from among the synagogue and meet with them on Sundays. So, <clears throat> so he would continue to go into the synagogues on Saturday until he had exhausted that and then establish the believers uh, to meet on Sunday separate so that the unbelieving Jews would not continue to present a problem to them. And then they gathered together on the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection. So, in 1 Thessalonians, the emphasis that Paul um, 
puts in this book is really focused on Christ's coming and at the end of each chapter he ends with some form of a thought regarding that in chapter 1 to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come we'll get into that more <clears throat> for what is our hope it's the end of chapter 2 or joy or crown of rejoicing is it not you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming the end of chapter 3 so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints that would include us the end of chapter 4 then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord and then finally in chapter 5 now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ so very much um, emphasizing uh, the coming of Christ and then this is early in Paul's ministry so the return of Christ uh, we have what the Old Testament says 17 out of 39 Old Testament books deal with that and then 23 out of the 27 New Testament books deal with the return of Christ statistically it's seven out of every ten chapters or 60 percent of the Bible amazing as you start to lay it out like that so here's the outline the past uh, Paul deals with the work of faith uh, he he gives a commendation to the Thessalonians in the first chapter um, in chapter 1 the first few verses is Paul's evaluation and then the evidence of the life in these Thessalonians and the explanation of the evidence as we go forward so this church uh, was a great model for churches to follow Paul says we give thanks to God always for you making mention of you in our prayers remembering without ceasing your work of faith labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father so notice the faith hope and love emphasize the attitude of the gospel because this is really what Paul is talking about the work labor and patience emphasize the activity so you get the attitude of the gospel um, <clears throat> in faith hope and love and you get the activity in the work labor and patience or endurance he goes on in verse 5 he says for our gospel that's the context did not come to you in word only but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance so the gospel is communicated through the Word of God and it's received and demonstrated by the power of God so note the emphasis on the connection of the work and the power so um, the power of the Holy Spirit is worked through the Word this is important so we need to be able to have both working in our life if you have too much Bible and that's all you have you'll dry up if the work of the Spirit isn't there because the Spirit is really the life that we enjoy and experience now certainly God gives a parameter in his word so our experience should not go outside of that parameter when we start dealing with the truth in our experience uh, a lot of people have a tendency to blame a lot of really goofy things on the Holy Spirit uh, the holy laughter movement and a lot of that nonsense that happened years ago um, you know they had a tendency to blame the Holy Spirit or actually you know uh, use as an excuse for their foolish behavior 
that the Holy Spirit was making them do it, <clears throat> but they were just a lot of fleshly activity. Now, if you just overemphasize Holy Spirit, you blow up. You're either going to dry up or blow up, and you'll blow up and um, end up like that movement, that holy laughter movement, doing some really crazy things, and um, your experience will far go far beyond the boundaries that the Bible puts on it. And we need to have the balance, and in the balance, you grow up. And that's the point, all right? We need a balance of uh, the truth of the Word and the work of the Spirit in our lives working together to mature. So, as we move on, in verse 6, Paul says, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the Word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So, they received the word, um, brought the joy of the Holy Spirit. So the word received resulted in that joy. Note both the acceptance of the word and activity of the Spirit. So the word needs to be received, and again, there we have that balance, uh, so that the activity of the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit works in with the truth of his own word it's not somebody else's word it's inspired by the Holy Spirit so this work was in the midst of affliction from both Jews and pagans if we were to go back to Acts 17 when Paul was moving through uh, Thessalonica he goes on he says from you the word of the Lord a lot of emphasis on the Bible here has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. What a great church example. They had the word of God. They had faith. They had an expression. And their faith in God resulted in their sounding forth of the word. The gospel went out from them and the truth went out from them. What a great church. And Paul didn't need to encourage them to spread the gospel because the Spirit of God was doing the natural work within them and as he worked that life in them then they were excited and then they shared what God was doing in their life if God's not doing anything in your life there's nothing to share that's the whole point so the Holy Spirit is key to the working and the um, the animating of the truth of the Bible. So he goes on the last couple of verses in chapter 1. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols, that's number one, to serve the living and true God, number two, and to wait to his Son from heaven, number three, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So <clears throat> Note the connection between verse 3, I'll show it to you in a minute, and this and these verses. So you have the work of faith in verse 3 connected with turn to God from idols in verse 9 here. That's step one, salvation is by faith. Then after they're saved, they have a labor of love. That's That was in verse 3 right with the faith hope and love and then it's connected with serving the living and true God here in verse 9 that's step 2 to serve the Lord that is the work of sanctification and then the patience of hope that is compared here to wait for his son from heaven and that's the third step waiting in patience basically for the rapture that we get to in chapter 4 now, waiting doesn't mean sitting around doing nothing, which Paul corrects in 2 Thessalonians when he writes to them. But waiting is serving. When it talks in Isaiah 40 about they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength, that is not waiting um, <clears throat> in the sense of doing nothing. Um, what that is, that waiting is, 
is like a waiter you are serving. Um, that is the idea behind the waiting in the Bible. So how are we delivered from the coming wrath? It's a good question. Through the rapture of the church to heaven before the seven year tribulation. The word from in this verse is apo and it means out of or away from. So we could read it in verse 10, Jesus who delivers us out or out of or away from the wrath to come which would be during the tribulation period Romans 5 9 says having now been justified by his blood <clears throat> we shall be saved from apo wrath through him out of wrath through him and then Acts 21 10 says a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea in other words out of he was away from Judea he was not in Judea so that's how the word is used so here's an overview of the book of Revelation and you can see my pointer there um, the rapture happens just before the seven year tribulation period and that's really <clears throat> after the church age which we see the seven letters to the churches in chapter two and three then you have the church in heaven in four and five and during that time the judgment through the seals trumpets and bowls are poured out the great tribulation that Jesus mentions in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse verse 21 that's technically the last three and a half of that seven year period. But prior to this wrath, during this time in Revelation 6 to 18, the church is taken out. And the church is taken out because we are delivered from out of this period of time, the seven years. So as we move on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we have Paul's manner of ministry. So he gives the message of ministry in the gospel, right? First couple of verses, he says that they were bold in our God to speak the gospel. He gives his motive in verse 3. No error, uncleanness, or deceit was in his message gives his method in four to six he didn't use flattering speech to hide covetous behavior we have a lot of that today uh, unfortunately even in the church there's a lot of flattering speech people patting themselves on the back and they do it to deflect the covetousness that they have or make an excuse for it there's no seeking self-glory or flaunting authority Paul said look we weren't imposing ourselves on you As we look at here in verse four to six, um, notice in verse five, he says, for neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness, uh, nor did we seek glory from men, either by you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. So, there was no demands that they made at all regarding the Thessalonians. So Paul didn't want to flaunt any of his apostolic authority, and, um, and he didn't. Uh, his method of ministry was um, clear to the Thessalonians. His manner of ministry is in verse 7 and 8, and it was gentle and affectionate and open. Uh, their hearts were open to the Thessalonians. In his work of the ministry in verse 9, uh, they worked day and night so that they would remove any financial burden from the Thessalonians and also um, that Paul could never be accused of preaching the gospel for money. So it was clear how he was uh, 
wanting to be perceived and how he was perceived by them. Moving on in the outline, he had a walk of his ministry in verse 10. The Thessalonians witnessed how Paul and his ministry team lived. Nothing was hidden. There was no secrets. Um, the words of his ministry in verse 11, 12 were exhortation to follow how Paul's team live. It's great if you can use yourself as an example for others, and that's what Paul did. And then in verse 13, Paul's words were appreciated, appropriated, and then applied. So the Thessalonians received the words that Paul shared as God's, which are true words, and then they had received them in affliction, but they were also in affiliation with other churches. In other words, they were following the models of the churches that Paul had established. So the Thessalonians uh, imitated other churches and they suffered similarly because of it. And so as they stood for the truth, um, people that were against the gospel would fight against them. And then in verses 15 and 16, there was affliction by those who reject the word. That was the result. And so those in rebellion against God that killed Jesus, Paul says, will also persecute his followers. And that's what they were experiencing. And finally, he ends the chapter with the spiritual battle of ministry because Satan had hindered Paul's attempts to visit this Thessalonian church again. But he was confident that he would eventually get back and that is part of the spiritual battle in ministry. In chapter 3, he gets into the confirmation uh, of the Thessalonians. And he's going to send Timothy, it says in the first five verses. And this is because um, they wanted to know Paul's state and concerns. So he would send Timothy to communicate from him. And then Timothy would go back, verses 6 to 10, to give a report uh, so Paul could hear the condition of the church. Um, no email, no postal mail. Everything was slow and tedious, and it took time. So there had to be patience. And then <clears throat> he concludes the chapter with a prayer. Um, and so in verse 11... The prayer that he might return to the Thessalonians. Uh, the prayer is to be, his prayer is to be really with the Thessalonians and be able to minister to them. Uh, in verse 12, the prayer is that the Thessalonians might grow in love. Uh, this prayer is for unity within the body of Christ. And then finally, in verse 13, the prayer that their hearts might be established in holiness. And this prayer is for the sanctification of them, the sanctification of the body of Christ. Chapter 4 begins the practical exhortation, as Paul always has the instructional part of his letters, the first part, and then he changes to application. So chapter 4 and 5 are the application chapters in the Thessalonian epistle. So in chapter 4, um, he talks about edification and then hope. He divides the chapter like that. So verses 1 to 12, he says to walk in a way respecting God's work. So in verses 3 to 5, he's dealing with that work in our lives towards unbelievers. He says, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, talking about your body in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So we obviously need to be living differently than the world, uh, not in the same immorality. Otherwise, there's nothing to present to them uh, to deliver them from their own bondages to bring them to the light of the gospel. And then <clears throat> in verse 6, through nine, he's dealing with the relationship towards the believers in the church. Uh, a couple of pieces of verses here from six, seven, and nine, he says one should take advantage 
Um, he's saying that this should not be that one should take advantage of and defraud his brother. Um, and he says, God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness, he says, you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. That's the work of the Spirit in our lives. So moving on, we get into the last section of chapter 4, which is the rapture. And this is a comfort to wait patiently. Again, this goes back to uh, chapter 1, where he talks about waiting patiently to the coming of the Lord. And this is where he expands on it. So, in verse 13, uh, they were not to be ignorant of what he previously taught concerning believers who died before the rapture, which they apparently were confused about. Uh, they thought that the, um, the believers that died had missed the rapture um, because the way Paul expressed the teaching on the rapture was that it could happen at any time. And since it could happen at any time, they were expecting it to occur. So if somebody died, they were concerned. Again, these Paul was there for three weeks. They were pagans uh, that got converted. They were not founded in the Old Testament teachings on life and resurrection. They were just learning a lot of this stuff uh, for the first time. So... <clears throat> he mentions in verse 14, believers who died, he calls it sleep in Jesus before the rapture will return with Christ when he returns for the rest of the body. Um, this is not soul sleep, which is a heresy. Uh, this is dealing with the body, not the soul. Second Corinthians 5, 8 says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So um, there are groups like uh, Seventh-day Adventists and such that teach soul sleep, that your soul, the immaterial part of you, somehow goes to sleep because they misunderstand where it says sleep in Jesus. But the problem is, is that the rapture, which is really the aspect of the resurrection for the church, that deals with giving life to a dead body has nothing to do with the soul. So the reason that believers are uh, termed sleep when they're dead is because they look like they're sleeping, but also doctrinally they're going to be waking up again. So living believers will not precede those who have died <clears throat> in the rapture, verse 15. Verse 16, it says, The voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God will sound. The trumpet of God is not those in the book of Revelation, we have a different context. In Revelation, the trumpets are judgments from heaven. In Revelation, the trumpets are those sounded by angels, not the trumpet of God. And then in Revelation, the trumpets are connected with woes. And this certainly is not a woe. Now, here's a model of the seven-year tribulation. We are currently in the church age. And <clears throat> prior to the millennial reign, we have this section of seven years. And as far as different views on the rapture, you have the pre-trib view. You have the mid-trib view, where three and a half years in, the rapture occurs. You have the pre-wrath view that occurs kind of partway between the mid-trib and the end. And then you have the post-trib view, where apparently as Jesus is returning, uh, he catches people up in the air and then just kind of turns around and brings them back down. Um, now, amillennialism will teach that the uh, post-trib view typically is the one that will be the, um, the view that they present. Um, I did a, a teaching on um, premillennialism that is on the the YouTube channel, but um, which goes into it in detail. But but basically, um, those that do not believe in a literal thousand year reign of Christ believe that everything's just going to kind of end at the end, and so the second coming is coincided with the rapture, and it's all at the same time. 
there are also those that believe that the um, rapture will occur at the end of the seven years and then the thousand years will begin um, that's historical premillennialism uh, unfortunately with that is that you then get um, a conflict between the rapture occurring at the same time as the dividing of nations um, the sheep from the goats Matthew 25 and the problem with having the rapture occur at that time is the separation of believers and unbelievers is made there's really no reason for the sheep and the goats so the pre-trib view is really the only one that will work without allegorizing any of scripture because you definitely have to allegorize the Bible in order to have something other than the pre-trib view um, you would have to remove the imminent return in other words that Jesus can return at any time and it would be more of a focus on waiting for the tribulation period as opposed to waiting for Christ to return so um, the rapture is Jesus coming for his church the second coming is Jesus coming with his church so we need to understand the purposes of each the pre-tribulation rapture is designed for uh, the body of Christ who's the bride of Christ to be taken with Christ and to avoid the wrath that's going to be poured out upon the world the unbelieving world <clears throat> and also that seven-year period is the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Uh, it is the time where God is going to not only give the world an opportunity to see a harvest of souls uh, through the 144,000 Jews that are preaching the gospel, but God is going to use this time to draw Israel back to him, that they will ultimately believe that Jesus is, Jesus of Nazareth is their Messiah, and then at that point they will cry out for him he'll return at the end of the seven years and then at at that time he'll be returning with his church so there's two aspects here there's the church going to be with jesus and then the church returning with jesus so um but only the imminent view that christ can return at any time is seen in the pre-trib view everything else requires people to be looking for the tribulation the antichrist and everything else and that's not what uh, Paul is teaching in any of his epistles so here's a, some uh, verses that deal with imminence or the fact that Jesus can come at any time first Corinthians 1 7 he says that we are eagerly waiting for the revelation which is a return the unveiling of our Lord Jesus Christ um, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, uh, Maranatha, right? O Lord, come. That's what it, the word means. In Philippians 3, 20, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. In other words, Paul is focusing on our waiting for the Lord. Uh, Philippians 4, 5, the Lord is at hand. In other words, it can happen at any moment, his return. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, Wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And we talked about that verse, how the word from is uh, apo, which means uh, out from or away from the wrath. Uh, Titus 2.13, what are we looking for? We're looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, not for the Antichrist. James 5, 7 to 9, he says, Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Same as Philippians 4, 5, at any moment. 1 Peter 1, 13, Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Jude 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord, which is the rapture. Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life and then finally these multiple verses in the book of Revelation uh, talk about the imminent return of Christ uh, for the church we need to remember John the Apostle was writing to the churches um, in the book of Revelation and the verse the verses noted in chapter 22 at the end of the book all express 
the fact that Jesus can arrive at any moment and that's um, those are in those multiple verses there that you can look up. So continuing on in the outline in chapter 4, the rapture as a comfort here to wait patiently in verse 16. Second half, it says the dead in Christ receive their bodies before the living who are changed at the last trumpet uh, the church will hear. So this is comparable to 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Paul says, I tell you a mystery. And remember, a mystery is not a whodunit that you can figure out. A mystery in the New Testament is something that was not prophetically revealed in the Old Testament, but needs revelation in the New Testament, which Paul is expressing right now. He says, we shall not all sleep, in other words, die, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. This is the trumpet of God that he's talking about in Philippians. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. That is the dead in Christ and we shall be changed. In other words, the living. So he's really expressing the same thing here in the context of 1 Corinthians 15 where he's talking about the resurrection, the raising of the dead at the end and throughout um, the course of the resurrection. Now, the resurrection is not a one-time event. The resurrection is a category. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection, uh, and that was 2,000 years ago. So um, the aspect of the resurrection that the church is involved in is the rapture of the church, and that's why there'll be a changing at the end and not just a moving of people into the millennial reign. So Verse 17, he says, all believers will be caught up. That's the word we get rapture from. Um, and the word rapture comes from the Latin version, which is translated uh, raptus. And so that's how we get that, that term. People say rapture is not in the Bible. Well, if you read Latin, it would be in the Bible. So that's where we get the term. Uh, all believers will be caught up, raptured to meet the Lord in the air and be with him forever. And so believers go to be with the Lord in heaven. He is not returning to earth at this point. His return will be in judgment, not completing the redemption of the church. So the rapture is the church going to be with Christ. He's returning for them. Uh, the second coming is Christ returning in judgment. So this message, verse 18, the last verse of chapter 4, should be comforting the believers in Thessalonica. Now chapter 5, uh, the last chapter of the practical application. In chapter 5, it's an escaping hope. So there are no signs, verse 1, right? Uh, he says, you know, he doesn't have to tell, talk about uh, signs and uh, times and seasons, right? There's no need that he write that for these Thessalonians because there are no signs for the rapture. And plus, uh, all the signs are related to Israel and what God is doing with them. So signs are associated with the second coming because it's relation to the nation of Israel, uh, not with the rapture. So uh, that's an important distinction that there are no signs for the rapture. Paul goes on in verse 2. He says, the day of the Lord will happen suddenly after the rapture and those stuck in it will not escape. Now, Paul is going to get into um, a connection here with what Jesus talked about in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 about these labor pains, and, and it's also associated in Revelation 6. So the labor pains are the time um, we are leading up to it now. However, once the seals start getting poured out, there's a correlation between these seals and what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. And once that time begins, then the people are locked into it, but the church will be out of it. So Paul goes on in verse 3 to 11, and he makes a distinction between the you, us, and we, and they. So uh, this distinction is clear. So Paul talks about the distinction um, and it's based on being suddenly stuck in the period, which is the they, where there is no escape from. 
these are the unbelievers so I'm gonna put up uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 here notice he says um, in verse 4 but you after he talks about sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a woman a pregnant woman and they right shall not escape in verse 4 he says but you there's the they and the you brethren are not in darkness so that that this day it's the day of the Lord that starts at the tribulation should overtake you as a thief you are all sons of light and sons of the day uh, we are not of the night nor of darkness there's the you and the we therefore let us not sleep as others do but let us watch and be sober for those that's the they who sleep sleep at night those who get drunk are drunk at night but let us the contrast who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So going back to um, the presentation, <clears throat> there will be no need to make a distinction in Paul's writing if believers are going to be in the tribulation period with the unbelievers. Um, because everybody would be facing the same conditions. So Paul makes the distinction so that they understand. And then moving on in ver uh, chapter 5, notice in verse 9, I had read that verse, wrath is not the appointment for the church. We are not appointed to wrath. So the tribulation period is a time of wrath and the church is not appointed to be there. Um, the church is not appointed to be in the time of wrath. And we see in Revelation 6, 16 and 17 that while the seals are being poured out, even the world recognizes that it is the wrath of the Lamb. Revelation 3.10 also promises the church uh, that it will not be in that time. It says, I also will keep you from, this is ek, means out from, the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So this is a global um, judgment, the whole world, those on the earth. But the Church of Philadelphia has promised uh, to be kept from it. Those are the ones that believe his word. In George MacDonald's commentary, he says, note that they will be kept from from the hour of trial, that is, from the whole time period. Also, they will be kept out of that period, Greek ek, not through it. So, McDonald's comment on Revelation 3.10, I think, is significant. And then we go on to verse 12 and 13. He says, be conscious of those laboring for Christ, right? Um, how to relate to various people in the body, in verses 14 and 15 and then he gives a short exhortation uh, in the last verses of the book so <clears throat> to be conscious of pastors laboring for Christ in verse 12 and 13 he says know them and respect them for the work they do so you can be at peace with each other uh, otherwise there's a lot of infighting and um, kind of craziness that can go on in different churches and then in verse 4 14 and 15 he tells how to relate to various people in the body he says uh, in first in verse 14 uh, warn the unruly comfort the weak support them or comfort the feeble-minded support the weak and be patient with everybody not returning evil to anyone uh, and then he gives short exhortations in the last verses. He says to rejoice, to pray, to be thankful. Um, don't stop gifts from being exercised. You'll notice that he uses the term quench when he talks about gifts, like putting water on a fire. 
Uh, and then when he talks about don't grieve the Holy Spirit in a different epistle, that is in relation to sin. Sin grieves the Spirit, but quenching puts out the work of the Spirit. And then he says, don't stop prophesying. Test everything by scripture and avoid any form of evil. So everything that happens obviously needs to be tested through the word of God. And then he gives final thoughts. And uh, he tells us that man is a three-part being of body, soul, and spirit. That God is faithful. That we need to pray. And then he says to greet each other. And he finally ends with reading this letter. He, he says that, the letter needs to be read to everybody, and it's the authority of God's word in the church. So hopefully that was simple enough for you and clear, and may God continue to bless you as you continue to study his word.